Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar about preparing and training your customer support teams to work with machine learning and AI tools. Today, we're joined by a wonderful group of industry practitioners, um, Sophie Conti and Hannah Baker. Uh, Sophie, if you don't mind introducing yourself and then Hannah, please. Perfect. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Mikael, for having me. Super excited to join us this good discussion and helping moderating it. Um, so I'm Sophie Conti, and I'm the founder of Customer Service Lab. We help uh, growth stage companies to make customer service a strategic advantage, whether it's adding new technologies or training the teams. And also because I like to share what I learn, I organize workshops for the CS community in the U.S. and as well in Europe. Hannah. Your turn. Great. Um, also very happy to be here. My name is Hannah Baker. Uh, I work at Magoosh, and we do online uh, self-study test prep tools for people trying to get into college, get into grad school. Um, so I have been at Magoosh for about three years. I started out managing um, our remote academic help team, um, and now I manage our um, I manage our other student help managers in-house who manage um, two of our remote teams that I'll talk a little bit more about later. Wonderful. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Hannah. Now, what's, what's interesting is that Hannah and her team have been using some form of machine learning and AI in their customer support and student support operation for a number of years. So in many ways, they're an early mover in this space and have lots of wonderful learnings from trying different products in AI and seeing how they work for their teams. So we're going to have a chance to hear a little bit about Hannah's experience with AI uh, in the second part of the presentation. And Sophie, through her customer service lab workshops, uh, they're very much uh, hands-on whiteboard type workshops where one of the top topics uh, in the last couple of years has been practical AI. So Sophie also has a wonderful wealth of experience on the topic. And I'll introduce myself. My name is Mikhail. Um, I'm the co-founder and president here at Digital Genius. Digital Genius is the customer service automation platform. We help companies scale their customer support operation through the use of practical AI tools. And there's a couple of realities that, that we're facing as an industry. Reality number one is that customer service has become the proven competitive advantage. So companies, uh, it's difficult for companies to compete on price, to compete on product. And so if a company has an outstanding customer service, uh, operation, then they will be much more competitive in their respective industry. And the reality number two is that every company in the world is going to have some form of machine learning or AI in their contact center in the next couple of years. Now, Sophie, you've talked to a lot of companies and uh, you've seen a lot of, a lot of uh, customer support operations. Do you think the statement is true? Yeah, I completely agree with it. Um, the more, I mean, lots of my colleagues and clients are actually in the midst of uh, deploying uh, AI solutions that are going to help with automation and helping the agents uh, providing better experience to customers. So, yes, I do agree with the statement. Great. And Hannah, what do you think about that? Uh, yeah, I think it's, you know, I think it's a real possibility. Um, it's certainly because there are ways um, that you can go about this, both in terms of automation or just supporting um, supporting the teams as they do their more manual work. Um, there's so many possibilities there that I think in some form it will be everywhere. Yeah, I agree. I think it's many ways like cloud computing. You know, there was a time when most uh, uh, data sat on on servers on in in the in the company, and today everything sits in the cloud. And so AI is very similar to that, that we think that any, every company in the world is going to have AI either supporting their agents or helping automate replies to customers. Now, the big question on top of a lot of people's minds is, how do you actually put the machine to work? So AI is great. It's all over the place. We hear it being marketed by big companies and small companies, but how do you actually put it to work? What are the practical applications of AI? And so we found that there's basically a formula that we have to think about when thinking about AI applications. It's AI tools uh, that are great to support agents who become more empowered and more effective in their job. So Sophie, what's your view on this? Yeah, it's definitely, uh, you know, there's great technologies and we're making tons of progress. Um, but uh, it's, we're not at the point where AI is going to replace completely human, not at all. And it's really about the equation 
uh, the human and the teams working with uh, AI machine learning algorithm uh, to help them do their job better, basically to augment them. So um, yeah, I think that uh, this is what we, we're going to see for, for some time. Yeah, so this is the formula to keep in mind. And this is the formula, Hannah, I know you guys have kept in mind at Magoosh when you started implementing AI tools, that it's, it's really there for your agents to support them. Um, is that right? Yes, definitely. Um, I'll, again, go into more detail later, but we do have full, some full automations now, but we started out only looking for something to support agents and not looking to do any automation actually at the beginning. And we really kept that, that model, but it's very balanced. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have a chance to cover that a little bit down the road. It's interesting how you started with agent support only, but then went to some automations would be curious to know what drove that. So we'll get to that. So let me give a quick example and a quick explanation of how AI can be used in practice today. And I'll do this from the angle of digital genius um, and how we, what kind of products we put out there for companies to use. And basically the thing underneath, the technology framework underneath all of our products at Digital Genius is called conversational process automation. And what it does is it connects conversations with backend customer support processes to drive resolutions. And, and this happens using AI. So as an example, a company, a customer might come in and ask a question such as, I'd like to get a refund, am I eligible? The first thing that a good AI product should do is use a deep learning model that has been trained on historical customer service conversations. So all those emails and chats and messages that already happened over the course of the last few months can be used to train an AI algorithm. So we, we do this training by converting the language transcripts into these mathematical representations of language called word vectors. And the word vectors are used to train um, basically a statistical deep learning model. So once a question comes in, our model understands what the objective of the customer is. But before replying to this customer, we need to find out some more information. So the first thing we do is we ping a backend system that will check and verify whether this company or whether this customer is actually eligible for the refund. And in this case, they are. So the refund action is taken automatically inside a backend system. In this example, it's Shopify, but it could be any other system that a company uses to manage their refund process. And the account status is updated to reflect the fact that this customer has now been refunded. And only then does an AI product um, that does this come back with an answer. But unlike a knowledge article or a deflection FAQ or a little scripted chatbot reply, this is actually a, a confirmation of a resolution that already took place. And then the idea is that the customer is really excited and happy because they've just gotten their refund in a matter of seconds instead of waiting a couple of hours or in some cases even a couple of days. So this is the technology framework that, that we believe works in the customer support space today. It's the idea of using AI to understand conversations and connect them to backend processes in order to solve support cases. And we, we've put that framework into two tangible product offerings. The first one is called Copilot, and that is our agent assist functionality. And the second one is Autopilot, and that is the example of what you just saw, full case resolution. So what is Copilot and how can you use an AI tool to support your agents? Well, the first thing that AI does really well is make statistical predictions around things like tags and classifications and, and case reasons. So when a question comes in, normally an agent has to go through a process of tagging and choosing from drop down menus, what is this case about? What is the priority of the case and so forth? So with an AI product, you can have this information predicted and pre-filled for the agent automatically before they receive the case. So this time an agent opens up a case or a ticket and all of this information has already been pre-filled for them. So they're saving a bunch of time on not having to click around and assign manual tags. The second thing that AI does really well is we, what we call answer prompts. So prompts are recommended answers that the AI algorithm suggests to the agent in real time. And it comes with a confidence score. And that confidence score is basically telling the agent, look, I'm the AI statistical model and I'm 95% confident that this is the right answer. And the agent has an opportunity to approve or personalize that particular recommendation. Now, the interesting thing about AI and something that everybody should keep in mind is that there's a process called continuous learning. And that means that anytime an agent approves or personalizes 
or even ignores an AI recommendation, it sends a signal back to the AI model and it goes through a process called continuous learning. So the model gets a little bit smarter over time and the recommendation it gives out are stronger each time. And so what is Copilot used for is mostly to reduce average handling time as well as accelerate agent onboarding and also increase agent retention. Here's an example of a company out there. This is a larger enterprise that's using Copilot now for over a year. This is KLM Royal Dutch Airlines, and they've now reduced their case processing time by approximately 50%. So if you see on this graph, these dark blue bars represent the time spent by an agent per case without AI, and the lighter, whiter bars are about um, the same case time uh, for, for cases with AI. So you can see that there's been a reduction of about 50% of case processing time across the board. This is incredible because today KLM is capable of handling twice as many messages in terms of volume with a similar agent headcount. So that covers Copilot and just to wrap it up on, co on Autopilot, this is the full end-to-end -end case resolution process that I talked about. What this does is it drives immediate responses and resolutions for customers and also leads to a rapid boost in customer satisfaction scores. So we get a lot of questions about, well, if, you're, if your reply comes automatically from an AI, doesn't it sound robotic and doesn't it lead to a lower CSAT score? And actually the answer is not really. We have a company called Course Hero that's now fully resolving 15% of their volume with no agent involvement using the autopilot. And the type of CSAT comments that they're getting are quite, are quite incredible. So these are real voluntary messages that, that end customers wrote back to the company after having a case resolved with autopilot. If you look at this, someone said, hey, I put in a refund request at 1120 at night when most customer service departments are closed. And within just one minute, they responded and handled my entire issue. These are the types of experiences that we want to provide to end customers so that they can go on with their day. Now, there's a few things that you can do. Once, once AI is there to help your agents achieve faster reply times and more accurate responses, what do you do with that time that's been unlocked? And so we have a couple of companies that are unlocking time for their agents and using it in interesting ways. For example, this company is using this time to focus more on difficult tasks, not repetitive tickets. And uh, they didn't have to hire new agents and train new agents this year because they had more jobs and more work available for their current team. Another example of a company is Travelbird. They're an online travel agency in Europe and they reduced their average handling time by 30% and used that time savings to train some of their support agents to do upselling and cross-selling. And as a result, they've now turned their contact center profitable. That's something that's quite rare, a profitable contact center. And finally, a company called Perfume Shop are now allowing their agents to invest more of their time into solving those complex customer queries that AI cannot handle. So that's it. In summary, with Digital Genius, we're focused on three things, helping companies transform their customer service operation into a competitive advantage, removing unnecessary costs from contact center, through the repetitive automation of tasks, and finally improving the customer and employee experience and satisfaction. So now that I've kind of gone through what, the, what, what we do and how our product uh, you know, brings AI to companies, I wanna spotlight Magoosh. So Sophie and Hannah are now going to discuss some of the applications that, that Magoosh has had with AI. And Hannah and Sophie, go ahead. All right, so Hannah, you want to, yeah. Present a little bit, yeah. Magush, first. <laughs> so, so just a little more background um, on kind of how, how we got to where we are and why we decided to start using AI. Um, so, Mikhail, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, this gives you a little bit of a sense of what our support structure looks like. So, again, we have, um, you know, an online education company, and it is self-study. So, we have... Um, online video lessons and practice questions for tests like GRE, GMAT, SAT, ACT, and students are working on their own. Um, but there are two main types of issues that they might face in their studies. Um, they might need academic help, um, need help understanding a concept, or figuring out a good study plan for them. Um, or, of course, they run into all the types of you know, technical problems or account issues or, you know, login stuff that um, anyone using an online product might, um, might encounter. So we have 
uh, two different support teams um, that work on these two main types of issues, and they're fully remote. So we have um, a manager for each of these teams in office, um, and then these teams are, are dispersed and um, working from all over the country. So uh, depending on the season, we get about two to 3,000 tickets per week. And because of the variety of tickets that we get, we have about 1,000 macros um, to help with these that do span academic, um, academic responses and uh, more technical responses. So um, the remote teams handle about 95% of tickets. There's very few that get elevated um, to the in-office team. Uh, and they're split nearly 50-50 um, between academic help and traditional, um, traditional support. So uh, what we were finding before we had AI was that we had all these macros, we had years worth of these really great historical responses, especially when it came to the academic side. Um, it takes a really long time to write out these academic explanations. And so we had all these historical responses, but um, nothing was very easy to find in Zendesk. Um, through the macro search or through advanced search. Um, it was hard to surface these things. So what really inspired us to start looking into AI was, okay, we want that kind of co-pilot function that Mikhail was talking about, where we just want something that will surface these resources easily, right, you know, within Zendesk while someone is looking at a ticket. Um, these things will come up and say, hey, I think this is something that might help you, either this historical response or this macro, um, and make that easier and much faster for the team. Um, so that was where we started. Um, now we're at a place where we have all of that going and we have gone this route of um, automating certain um, ticket types, none for academics, but you know, these really low hanging fruit um, you know, account extensions, password resets, things like that. We went ahead and automated. Um, so now we have about 15% of our total tickets that are fully automated. Wow, that's excellent, Hannah. Thank you for the overview. And it's been wonderful to work with you and your team over the last couple of years to achieve these results. Um, there's a lot of learnings that happen, I know for a fact, from the different implementations of Copilot and later Autopilot, and we want to zoom in on that. So, Sophie, um, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the discussion phase, and I know you have some questions for Hannah that, that you want yep. to ask. Yeah, definitely. First, uh, just for everyone to have a, um, a little bit more background, Hannah, uh, when did you implement this Digital Genius? How long? How many years has, this been, has it been? Uh so it's been about two years, um, okay. and we did try one other um, one other AI solution before Digital Genius, um, and it got us, you know, a certain part of the way to where we wanted to go. And then we've been with Digital Genius um, to get more functionality, and we've been working with them for about two years. Perfect. So, you know, we talk about AI, we talk about how we, may, we implement uh, um, an AI solution, what the algorithm is going to do, uh, the type of stats it's going to improve. Um, but we don't talk too many times, too much about, you know, the human side and how it impacts the team. Uh, who's going to be working with the algorithm and with the AI. I say algorithm because for me it's algorithm. <laughs> so, but, uh, so I switch between algorithm and AI. Um, so my question to you, Hannah, is over this, uh, over two years, so what have been your main learnings uh, for your team um, using AI? Sure. Um, so uh, kind of the big one that I'll start with is what you already started to touch on, Sophie, which is right. We we talk about what does the algorithm do and what is the machine and how does it work, um, and that is something that Magoosh, we had a lot of insight into as managers of the student health team, and we were you know meeting with Digital Genius and we're doing the research and we're understanding the product really deeply. Um, but for our remote teams, you know we were. Communicating in, you know, we thought we were communicating well, saying, okay, this change is going to come up. 
um, and here's when it's going to happen, and here's kind of the basics. But um, they didn't get that deeper understanding of what this is and how it works, and it really did um, have some sense for them. You know, they might kind of joke, oh, it's going to take our job, and they were joking, um, but they're really... <laughs> Lack of understanding there, um, you know, it really actually reflected something a little bit deeper. Um, yeah. They said, well, I don't know what this thing is, and it's going to be playing a huge role um, in our work, and it's really going to affect our work. And um, they didn't totally understand um, the mechanics of it, and what was it really doing, and what was the purpose, which for us was clear, you know, hey, this is a, you know, a support tool for you. Um, and we didn't really make that quite clear enough, I don't think, from the beginning. So that was something that um, we had to do over time. And if I were doing it again, I would have front loaded some more of that information for them. Yeah. And, you know, it's not the first time that I'm hearing that. Um, and I think that it's a very important point because, again, other colleagues, you know, and clients told me, uh, the same thing, that they underestimated how important it was actually to demystify the AI image, like you said, uh, or, you know, the, the machine is going to take uh, my job. Uh, and it's pretty easy to demystify, like you said, by really explaining how it works and what it's going to be doing exactly. Um, and it makes sense that by doing that, uh, I mean, it should, you know, help the team to really understand what the AI will be doing and uh, their level of acceptance and, mm -hmm. uh, and also understanding. And, and I think that it's because we're not completely clear yet about, you know, what's the role of AI, what's the role of human. Uh, we're still kind of experimenting with that. Um, but at least explaining exactly what you think it will be doing uh, will help yeah. with understanding their role. Um, and talking about role, um, so we know that it's called machine learning algorithm. It's because it doesn't learn by itself. At the beginning, you need to fit uh, the algorithm some knowledge, so it needs to be trained. Um, and I know that when we talked before, you said that one of the, like the second big learning was about that, about the teaching role of the agent. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. So we did let our teams know from the beginning, you know, hey, it, you know, this thing is going to learn initially from our past tickets, but for that ongoing learning, it's going to need your input. You know, it needs you to fix it when it's wrong. I and mean, we did communicate that from the beginning, um, but our um, our support agents were very experienced. They, you know, were very kind of smooth and set in their processes as they were working. Mm -hmm. And so to suddenly have them, you know, to say, oh, you actually need to be, you know, checking the tags and checking this thing, um, you know, the exam field and these different areas that before, you may not, you, you know, you might have said it yourself, but you weren't needing to double check anything else. Um, that was kind of disruptive for them. And we found it difficult to actually implement that consistently. Some mm -hmm. people were really good about checking and, you know, changing tags if needed and, you know, actively helping the machine learn. And other people, you know, were kind of just thinking, well, this, you know, I don't have to do it just to make the ticket and it's disruptive to my flow. I'm just not going to do it. I'll let other people help the machine learn. So um, we had a hard time putting that onus on the agent. Um, so something that we decided to do that uh, we found helpful was kind of separate out um, the, the active role of teaching by the agents from um, what the machine needed to learn. So um, for example, we really just had, we set it up with Digital Genius and we said, hey, we want it to learn through tags, um, but not through these required fields um, for our tickets like exam and ticket types. Mm -hmm. um, so we continued on with just our regular process of, hey, you, you know, set the exam, set the ticket type manually as you're doing your work, because they were used to that. Um, and meanwhile, those things were applying tags. And then the machine was learning from the tags to say, okay, did, are the tags matching um, these fields that the agents are filling out manually like they always have? And that way, they were helping it to learn without having to change their process, without adding an extra layer of complexity that actually 
kind of went against the whole um, idea of yeah. efficiency we were going for. Uh, we found ways to have the machine learn from them through their natural processes without asking them to, hey, add this step to your process in order to help the machine learn. Interesting. Um, yeah, it's, I think that obviously you did the, the, the right thing, which was to really explain that the, the algorithm needs to be taught um, but there's always some resistance when it's adding already on your, on your workload at the beginning. Um, so do you think that would be a way to actually create a brand new role of uh, like the AI trainer in kind of uh, isolating that? Uh, yeah, I do think that's possible. I think um, it maybe depends on, you know, how early are you implementing this? you know, what's the ticket volume, um, kind of what's the structure of your team. I think it's possible to have a role like that uh, where someone is essentially doing, um, you know, QA, but exactly as kind of a liaison between the agents and then the AI and uh, facilitating that learning. Um, yep. So that's something I've specifically thought about before, but I, I think it's possible. Hmm, interesting. Yep. Sorry, I, I was just uh, thinking about that loud. So, <laughs> uh, and and you. So let's talk about your third big learning, uh, which which is super interesting. Um, uh, go ahead. Okay. Um, so uh, for this one, it's kind of you know a, a big surprise that we had, um, a very unexpected learning. You know, we knew we would have. Um, some bumps along the way with teaching the machine or getting people to use the tool effectively. Um, but what really surprised us was, as I mentioned, we have all these, you know, really experienced agents who have, you know, been with us for, you know, one year plus, nobody new on the team, um, and they're all so good at what they do. And then we thought, okay, great, yeah, they can, they can teach the machine because they're the experts, and so we've got the perfect team to do this. But then, once we did implement AI, even though we told them, hey, you're going to teach it, it's here to help you, you're the experts, there was this sense from the team when the computer didn't agree with them that <laughs> they might be wrong. Um, so instead of them like, oh yeah, I do this all the time, I know what this should be, I know this response is right or wrong, or I know this tag is right or wrong, they were feeling like, oh, whoa, hold on. It didn't bring up what I thought it would. Am I doing something wrong? Have I been doing something wrong this entire time? Um, and that was really not something that we, that we were expecting. And, and it, it was not, not the reality. Um, so they were still, you know, it's true that they did have the knowledge and they were doing things right, um, but they just had that doubt. So, um, Again, it just really brought home that importance of um, talking with them about what's the purpose of the tool. You know, it's to support you. It's to learn from you and eventually take some of these things off your hands, but it's not going to be perfect at first. Um, and really helping them trust themselves uh, to know that everything they've been doing all along is great. Um, they are the experienced ones. They should keep doing what they're doing. Um, and uh, make sure that they have that confidence that they know, okay, yeah, the computer, the machine is going to be wrong sometimes, um, maybe a lot of times in the beginning. And, you know, use your best judgment. Don't let it hold you back. Um, don't doubt yourself uh, because you are still the expert here. So that's, that's a very interesting uh, finding and learning, uh, I thought. And I was, uh, like you, I was very surprised when, when you told me that the first time, how suddenly the agents were lacking uh, confidence in front of the AI. And, and maybe it goes back to the first learning, which was about uh, demystifying uh, the robot, the, the machine who's supposed to be, you know, very always correct. Um, so that's, uh, that's super interesting. But at the same time, it means that also, uh, you know, the team and the people working with the AI can also learn maybe new ways of uh, seeing things and thinking about particular problems. So, um, like I said, at one point, it's really, really still uh, experimenting and, uh, and trying to find or tr just trying to understand how this working relationship 
between uh, you know human as a team and and the machine is going to work out. Um, so super interesting. Um, I also want to talk about uh, uh, kind of um, um, another topic because we talked about. Um, I want to deep dive a little bit in the training, uh, the skills. So these days we read and hear a lot about uh, the change of the nature of work that AI is going to bring and create, uh, you know, everywhere, but in, especially in customer service because we search at the forefront of uh, this AI revolution. Um, and we hear that uh, you know, AI is going to be handling all the routine tasks, typically handled by, by tier one in CS. So the easiest task uh, that usually do not require any soft skills and that the agents are going to be left with more complex escalated inquiries uh, that do require more soft skills. So I wanted to ask you, Hannah, did, are you observing that uh, uh, at Magush? Are you observing this kind of shift of skills or not? Uh, how is it working at Magush? Uh, so for us, um, we, place a real emphasis on soft skills at all levels. And, um, you know, no matter tier one, tier two, who's handling it, um, that's just something that is really important to us is to um, handle everything with a lot of personalization and a lot of care um, and to use those soft skills that we hire for at every level. So um, now, you know, we have moved towards um, automation where at first maybe we were a little nervous, like, oh, you know, will CSAT go down? Um, you know, are people going to miss our personal tasks that we really use at every level? Um, mm -hmm. That ended up being kind of unfounded because you can still write a very, we have the term Magushi, um, <laughs> Magushi automation that, you know, gets people an extension in seconds. And it comes with a very friendly tone. And um, so we were like, okay, we can, we can still do all that stuff even with automation. Um, and so instead of feeling like, oh, well, now we don't have to hire people um, with just those tier one skills because we always mm -hmm. hire for, you know, a, a great variety of skills and for having those soft skills. Yeah. Um, but now being able to pull people off of those, you know, 15% of tickets um, that the automations are handling and they are already very, um, very trained and very capable. Um, we're able to put them on other types of projects um, that are related to student help and customer support, but are actually supporting other teams at our company. Um, so doing more collaboration between, um, you know, student help and marketing, where we're having our teams who are so knowledgeable about our students, um, you know, surface themes and pass them on to marketing or to product. Um, we don't have a, you know, customer success center or department. And so it's kind of delving a little bit into that area, um, freeing up their time to be able to work on these new types of projects that are great for their development and great for the company to get these people who have such insight into our students through all their interactions and actually use them in, in different ways and not just purely answering tickets all day. Nice. So basically, so what you're saying is that uh, the use of AI diversified the type of tasks that they're doing. Yes, exactly. Because we said, okay, great. Now we have some extra time. How yep. else do you use all your skills? And we found plenty of applications. Exactly. And are they happy about it? Do they realize it? Uh, yeah, you know, we've definitely gotten a lot of good feedback, um, you know, especially in the last year or so, as we have really, you know, diversified those responsibilities and gotten people connected with other teams, they interact with just, you know, more than just their direct manager in office. Um, we've gotten a lot of good feedback that people are enjoying being, feeling so much more involved in the company as a whole. That's great. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you so much, Hannah. So, uh, Mikael, uh, why don't we go to uh, the Q&A part? Absolutely, great plan. Thank you for that wonderful discussion. 
I just want to uh, highlight such a delicate balance um, that, that companies need to think about getting right between using the right AI tools and communicating the right information to their team to make sure everybody's engaged. And the, the, that, that question that came up, Hannah, in your business about confidence and experienced agents sort of thinking about double checking their work with the AI recommendations, there's, that, that's definitely a reality, absolutely. And there's also the opposite reality, which is brand new agents that have never you know, worked in the company before who are now getting these recommended answers mm -hmm. on day one. So in many ways, it's, it's actually giving them extra confidence to, to do their job. So it's always, uh, you know, there's two sides to every story. And uh, uh, I'm just excited that we could look at both. So we've got a few questions already coming in. Uh, let's start with this first one. Uh, it says, can digital genius be integrated with email and auto responses versus just chat inside Zendesk? Well, yes, of course, yes. So uh, DG is available on all text-based channels, including email support, of course. And Hannah, I think for you guys as well, um, there's a lot of email support. In fact, isn't it mostly all email support for your team? Yes, exactly. So we use Zendesk as a platform, but um, the interaction is all through email. We don't do text or phone. Yeah. Yeah. So e email is a great channel. It still drives a ton of volume in terms of customer support. Um, and um, because it's such an asynchronous channel, it's, it's really easy for AI to start recommending answers and automating answers through that channel. Um, but other channels work as well. So on that topic, actually, Hannah, you mentioned earlier that you started out with just Copilot. And then you had moved on and you added autopilot for automation. Can you tell us a little bit about the thought process and what kinds of things you added in your autopilot? Yeah, sure. So, um, uh, you know, we kind of had these two conflicting ideas. You know, one was that, oh, we, we really want to keep our personal touch. As I mentioned, we, you know, we were really hesitant to give that up. Um, but one of our core missions um, as a department is to unblock students in their studies and if you know if they suddenly can't um, log in and access their study materials because their account expired but there's still three days to their test um, you know we didn't want to be taking a day of those three days uh, to get them back into their account because you know we want to give them that free extension it's no problem at all they can just have it but it was taking us time to get to that ticket um, so, you know, we really thought that was more important than any reservations we had about, um, you know, giving up that, you know, that personal interaction and connection uh, was being able to unblock students more quickly um, so that they weren't having any snags in their studies. So that's what really drove us to um, look at account extensions, um, refunds, and, uh, uh, you know, any sort of password issue um, to look at those as really good candidates for the autopilot, um, because those are the things that really prevent people from continuing their studies in the moment. Whereas on the academic side, we said, okay, we feel good with just the, the co-pilot function. Um, it's okay in the course of their studying, they send in a question, they continue on studying, and then they get that, um, that explanation a little later. We felt okay with that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Great. So, yes, so the tougher academic replies are more co-pilot driven, whereas some of the repetitive functional um, issues such as password resets or extensions um, are, are placed on autopilot to, to give your students mm -hmm. Resolution. Great. So that actually leads us into our second question. Um, and by the way, there's a lot of people on this call. So if you haven't found the chat widget yet or the Q&A uh, button where you can ask your questions to us live and we'll reply to them. So a question came in uh, saying it's good to hear the AI impact to help reduce average handling time. But what has been the impact on first contact resolutions or negative response rate? So I'll quickly touch on first contact resolution. And then um, Sophie and Hannah, maybe if you could think about the negative response rate and also first contact resolution from your experience. In our experience, the autopilot mode is, that, um, is, is the functionality we showed earlier, which uses AI to understand the question and then taps backend systems and performs actions in backend systems to fully resolve tickets and then reply to the customer. And this happens in a couple of seconds, right? So the idea of a first contact resolution for those top topics that are being automated with autopilot, it, it's, it's, it's incredible. Like let's say a customer comes in with a refund request, has an extremely high confidence rate of that being automated. And the first contact resolution is, is literally, you know, it's, it's, it happens in the same exact 
reply. So it's not like we send back a knowledge article and the customer has to read what they have to do and then come back to you with other information. No, the entire case is fully resolved by connecting that conversation with those backend systems. Um, and then Hannah, Sophie, do you have anything to add in terms of um, FCR and negative response rate? Uh, I can add something for the for the negative response rate. Um, agree with everything just said about the uh, first contact resolution. Um, so uh, for CSAP, this you know something that's extremely important to us, and we definitely have had some challenges with it as we've um, moved more into that autopilot mode. But I will say that none of it is because someone has gotten you know an automated response. Um, you know, nobody that we've seen has minded the fact that they instantaneously got exactly what they needed, even though it's, you know, not from a real person. Um, so that has not been an issue at all, um, that kind of concern of, well, what if we lose the personal touch? Where we have struggled um, is just with the complexities of our back end and with students who have subscriptions for multiple tests um, at multiple times or simultaneously. Um, getting making sure we're getting it right that if they ask for an extension it's going to the right product um and that you know they're getting the correct action um that is where we've had to put in you know additional work and just work really closely with digital genius because nobody minds hearing from a computer um but they do mind having the wrong action taken so just really finding that balance and figuring out how far do we want to push it what are we comfortable with um and then you know just monitoring it and working closely with with your AI tool um, and the people who are managing it to make sure that those, those actions are correct. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for that feedback, Hannah. Actually, a lot of AI today is still kind of presented as a black box. Like, how does it actually learn? Like, how do I know it's automating? And so we tried to, we built into our product uh, a control center where any business user can manage their own AI models. They can track the, the, the amount of automations that are happening. They can check whatever executions and actions took place and basically have a, a, have a place, have a dashboard they can rely on to manage their AI model and it doesn't look like a black box. So when right. the AI model learns to a certain extent, it'll actually tell you that a, a certain topic has become eligible for automation and you can turn automation on if you want to. Great. So we have another question coming in. Uh, do the panel have any facilities management or similar contact center examples or use cases? Mm. Sophie, from your work, have you seen any facilities management examples with AI? Uh, meaning like contact centers, like big BPOs are using, uh, using AI? Is it, would, is, it, is it how you would interpret the question, Mikhail? Um, that, that's definitely one interpretation if you, yeah, exactly. Yeah. We got the, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah go ahead. So I, I see and I hear, um, it, you know, so there's two ways of approaching, uh, AI so, so, in two ways that I see, uh, uh, big companies and, and, um, uh, contact centers also approaching that. So either by, uh, using, um, out of the box solutions like yours, uh, or uh, bringing their own uh, AI team and hiring AI engineers and, uh, and building their own uh, algorithm. So uh, there's still these two different approaches. Um, Mikael, I don't know if you're seeing like kind of a combination of both. I'm sure that it's happening or, or not, if it's, if it's going to happen, but I see these two different approaches. So definitely like big BPOs, uh, I see them developing their own AI uh, and their own algorithms for uh, particular purposes. It's, it's interesting, Sophie. We, we get about three or four phone calls every week from uh, a BPO, from a number yeah. of BPOs that are looking to license and white label our technology to then you know, basically resell it to their end users. And, yeah. and and the relationship with BPOs is really interesting because their business depends on having the number of agents doing the work. And any tool, you know, any tool that rapidly increases the efficiency of those agents or even automates some of the repetitive stuff is kind of tends to hurt their business. And what we're yeah. seeing, the BPOs are split into two groups. One group uh, that they're not quite sure how they're going to figure this out for their business model. And then there's a few BPOs that are super innovation driven. And they actually understand that in the future, as a BPO, 
they're not only responsible for the people, but they also have to bring the technology. And so AI has become a kind of a table stakes technology that a BPO needs to bring to the table when they're out there, you know, advocating for new business or supporting their existing customers. So we in general, you know, we, we have, we're very hopeful for BPOs to take the right approach and kind of are open to working with them uh, on that. Uh, great, um, yeah, great, great insight. Great. So I think that's all we have for today. We're out of time. And uh, if anybody has other questions, please just drop them in the Q&A window. We'll keep it open for another 10 seconds or so. And we'll answer those via email. Sophie, Hannah, thank you so much for joining us this morning for this webinar. It's been a pleasure having you. Thank you for bringing this information to the table. Thank you so much for having me. Yep. Hannah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Great. We're going to end the meeting for all. Uh, have a good day.